on Zoom, we have Brad Lindmark, correct? Uh, Steve Schultz, Dorothy Red, and what's his name? Dave Kelly. And Dave Kelly. And Brad. You said Brad. Okay, so we're going to uh, begin tonight with a presentation from the Rockford Area Arts Council. So I will turn it over to Mary and McNamara first. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. I know you guys have a lot going on. Um, appreciate the time to talk about the Arts Council. I think it's been a while since we've been here uh, presenting to you. I really don't know the last time. I know that I'm new-ish. Uh, I've been there since January 13th of 2020. So just before the fun started. Um, uh, we are a four county service area membership organization, the Arts Council. So we actually serve Oval, DeKalb, Boone, and Winnebago counties. Um, with Rockford, with local arts agencies like ours, they choose areas that have urban centers. So that's why we are the Rockford Area Arts Council because we are the, the urban center is of course Rockford. Um, our mission statement is to support, promote, and develop access to the arts for everyone. It's a pretty tall order. Um, I initially came on the uh, staff and said, I don't think we have the budget for providing arts for everyone, but um, it is a mission statement, it's lofty, and we um, really aim to do that. And really what I added to the mission statement is that there is access. So access to the arts for everyone is really our, is our trust. Um, with the support of Chairman Chirelli and the Mayor McNamara, we are looking to develop a cultural plan um, a regional cultural plan, so a shared vision of um, resources, of uh, programming, of installations of public art, of including the municipalities that are um, ancillary and, and smaller than, obviously, than the urban hub of Rockford. So um, I'm very excited that we've already been working with Chairman Chirelli, and he's um, through uh, his approval, we were given 40 hours, technological service hours from R1, and they have we've really had a great relationship with them this year. They've given us filtered grant opportunities for the arts and culture sector. So we were able to um, turn that around and give that to all the arts and culture organizations, and not just in our county, but in the other counties, but primarily Winnebago County. And people have turned around and then turned those grants into dollars for their organization. So it's been very exciting for us. Um, uh, as, as far as starting a relationship with the county that wasn't even there before. And it's nice that Chiarelli himself is a, and you know, related to a lot of artists. So he has a deep appreciation for what that brings to a, a community. Um, slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to talk about who we are and this will be maybe five to seven minutes. I hope that's okay. Um, because, you know, I might not get back here. <laughs> you may not want me back for a while. Um, the Arts Council is a bridge builder, advocate, clearinghouse, and access provider. So as a bridge builder, I like to talk about the collaborative relationships we have with the park district, with NICME, with the city, with the county, with the library, with public school districts, with private schools. Um, I'm also part of like, the park district's public art committee. I'm part of NICME's nonprofit advisory committee. So there are lots of ways that we collaborate um, in our region. And, and have a voice for the arts and culture sector. Um, we are an advocate, so we advocate um, with our state and federal legislators, as well as our city and our county to leverage um, what we have in our resources of the arts and culture sector to get funding for those um, really important uh, institutions that help bring you know, a rich, vital life, quality of life to our area. We are the clearinghouse. Um, we provide grant opportunities, funding opportunities um, for individuals and for organizations. So for artists themselves, we provide uh, funding opportunities and that could mean that we've gotten a grant and we subgrant, or it could mean that we steer them to these grant opportunities that are out there. Um, we provide consultant work uh, through the city's dollars that they give us right now currently. One of the things that we do for the city um, and with the city is sit on their consultant um, groups for um, corridor planning, for example. So that's something we could do with the county as well. So as experts in our field, we can sit on corridor planning committees or other planning committees. We're on the R1s um, rail, passenger rail um, committee. And we talk about the impact of the arts and the culture sector on those plans. So for example, if you're looking at the corridor plan for 11th Street or Auburn Street, it goes right into the county, both of those streets do. 
into your arena. Um, we talk about you know unification through something aesthetic. So instead of just throwing up a light, could we do that in a more aesthetically pleasing way? Could there be a way to make those lights, those safety lights, look interesting, look unified, maybe reflect the area that they're from? Maybe look at them through the lens of you know the um, industrial history that's in that neighborhood, that kind of thing. So we we add our expertise to those sorts of uh, to those sorts of committees, and then access providers. So we provide um, free programming for all of our summer programs, which are open to all Winnebago County residents. Um, so it doesn't matter what your income is or where you're coming from, you are able to attend our camps for free. 87% um, of Americans recognize that access to the arts equals quality of life. And I think that that's, you know, we can all relate to that um, statement. Slide, please. I just want to mention this one because it's fun. It was the Rockbury Arts Awards this last May. Karen Chiarelli and Mayor McNamara um, narrated. You could say they had a lot of notes to read. Those are just the winners of the awards. We had nominees to go through. So they read a lot and they learned a lot. Um, it was an incredibly rich experience seeing um, uh, I sent you a video just recently. Um, Karen did actually, LEA sent you a video. That it's 18 minutes, so you know, put it on when you're having a cup of coffee and reading your emails. It is fun, fantastic. It, you will see what is going on in the arts world. These were just the nominees for these arts awards. And it just gives you an idea of the depth and the breadth of our art, arts community that is taking place in Winnebago County. So I just wanted you to see that. And, um, it's really just a highlight of the artists themselves. You could slide it again. Thank you. Okay, so I like to talk about art being uniquely accessible, and um, that means, you know, you experience everyday life from choosing the clothes that you pulled out of the closet this morning, or a playlist in your car, or installing art on the walls of your home. We are all connected to art every day. I like to talk about art as a distinguishing part of our public history, so um, it reflects our rich and diverse cultures. I like to talk about art as providing an opportunity for self-reflection and awareness and growth, very important to a community as personal growth of an individual in it. And arts and culture between citizens and can, can, and can encourage empathy and compassion like many other things can help. So that is the power of art. And then I like to talk about the real value that it adds to our community in terms of dollars and cents, of course, and in the abstract sense what? of instilling and a sense of place and a strong community identity that you cannot put a price tag on. Um, creative place you know, one of the sculptures here that you can see um, there is a significant economic development tool and can be highly transformative for a region in terms of um, income generation and job growth. So it's it's really an economic contributor. Slide, please. Excuse me one second. Yeah, please. Uh for the, um, members on Zoom, can you please mute? Thank you. All right. So just talking about access to the arts and the, the benefits it includes. I went over some of those just now, revitalization, education, civic engagement, healthcare, and economic development quality of life. Um, it really, there is not an area that art doesn't touch in a positive way. And that's really what I'm trying to get across. Slide, please. Okay, so revitalization. So these are just some fun quotes and I can send this to you if you'd like to look at this on your own time. I, I realize that you're busy, but it can revitalize run down sections of regions. It can um, improve students uh, performance in school, uh, whether they get their art enrichment in school or out of school, it improves their performance as students. On the slide, please. Civic engagement, of course, um, it can create common understanding between citizens that may not have any familiarity with each other, whether it's religion or race or politics. Um, critical thinking about the work that you're looking at or critical thinking then goes into other parts of their lives, right? And can be used to address community development and equity issues. So the things such as homelessness and job growth and um, illiteracy and uh, civic engagement, people who are interested in the arts vote. So that's something you might all wanna know as candidates also. Um, healthcare. And now, obviously, you're installed, but you are always kind of a candidate. In um, healthcare, arts and medicine contribute to lower healthcare costs. Period. Um, it's proven there are a gazillion studies on it, and there are reasons why you know arts enrichment in those um, institutions are critical. It's critical. Um, slide, please. And then economic development. We talked about that being a transformative tool. 
and then quality of life. Um, just to see 87% of Americans recognize that access to the arts equals quality of life. And I think, you know, that's because they're thinking, you know, do I go to a concert? Do I, you know, do I go to a forest preserve and there's a sculpture installed there? Do I go to hear, um, you know, live music, uh, you know, whether it's in the, in the rural setting or in the city, um, galleries, museums, that sort of thing. Uh, slide. Okay, so I just wanted to finish with um, last thought. Chairman Chiarelli and I have had conversations about other communities that we've been in that we like the way they work uh, for certain, in certain ways. So for example, um, we've talked about Madison, we've talked about other towns, you know, and they're wonderful and, and not so great for certain reasons, but they have a mutual respect for county and city residents and, and um, that interaction between the county and the city. And that's starting to come back. That approach to our city and county relationship is starting to return and the Arts Council wants to be part of that reunion. Um, the county includes the city and um, as Joe Shirley told me, the city is included in the county. So we're actually all Winnebago County residents. Um, and that's something to remember. And of course, in terms of supporting the Arts Council, um, we're asking the county to consider mirroring the city's contribution, um, which is 50,000 right now, um, to the Arts Council. In return, the Arts Council will obviously continue to provide access to the arts for everyone, which 95% of our programming and resources does include county residents. There is very little that's restricted to Rockford people only. Um, and we will increase our commitment, you know, both to the urban and the rural and the seniors and the children um, to make our region and, you know, obviously Winnebago County is in that a better place to live, work and um, enjoy. So I really appreciate your time. And I understand that everybody's budgets, you know, need to be sliced and diced for all sorts of reasons, but I really would like you to consider any type of extra funding or, you know, the funding that you're receiving from the federal government, even on a trial basis, you know, for a couple of years, consider giving to the Arts Council and see what you see coming back to you as uh, county board members and see if that investment would be worth it. So that's my request today. Appreciate your time. Um. Does any questions? questions? I don't have any questions. I have. I just want to you know, do a contribution to this. Uh, the Art Council has been around for a long time. They've done fantastic things in, the, in, uh, in this area. And I'm glad to see that it's expanding out into the whole county and not just into the big city. Uh, the other thing is down out of the Ware Center, they, if you're familiar with Ware Center on the Main Street, part of uh, Rosecrans. One of the things with their um, with their clients is teaching them art. They found out a long time ago that they didn't have any type of, of mental illnesses or abuses or have um, any type of uh, substance abuse. And going through the arts, uh, they have a whole room about, about this size that they come in and they are taught the different arts because it teaches them concentration, it, can, it teaches them coordination, and it's a big deal out there. Um, and it's amazing, people who experience a lot of pain, also if they join the different art classes, this, is all, this also has um, relieved the pain that they suffer and have. So I know it's a really good it, it truly is good. Um, Mary, have you been part of all the artwork that's going around all over town? Yeah, um, and if you see those mural, the mural installations yeah. and in the sculptures, and how the about murals, Boone County? Uh, Boone County? Yeah. Not as much in Boone County, no. No, we've had a number of our mural installations that went farther north now. We have a couple in Pecatonica and, um, oh gosh, Rockton and, Oh, there's another one too. I apologize, I'm forgetting right now. But that creative mural installation by RACVB, they are committed to one, including the Arts Council now, which is nice. We were not included in that. And that it wasn't a disclusionary thing. It just nobody, there was whatever happened there, they weren't doing it together. And now we are. So actually the Arts Council's mural is at Winnebago and West State. I don't know if you've seen that, but that's the one we sponsored and that has five impactful regional leaders. So we've got mm -hmm. Sarah Dorner on that one. 
We've got Angel Martinez, we've got Fred Van Vliet, we've got Michelle Williams, and we have Bing Liu. So those are just five individual individuals that represent our our county and who comes from from this area in, in a way that they're contributing locally and nationally as well. Yes, and art as a way of expression is incredibly important, you know, obviously for those who are suffering mental illness, substance abuse, etc. But it's actually, you know, just as good for those of us who um, just are stressed out at our jobs or having issues with their children or um, need an outlet. It is, it's just as valuable. Before you go to Loves Park, you know, or yeah. um, those the smaller towns, and then you know we want to do it well in Winnebago County, which that relationship hasn't been forged yet. And I see that as being primary. And then we can say to Boone County, "What more can we do for you?" And then this is what we can do for you if you fund us. So right now we primarily serve Winnebago County. That's just our Illinois Arts Council charge. And I guess that I will just say typically, if there is such a thing. Typically, what might your annual budget be and how much equity paid staff do you have? And how much what? Paid staff? Yes, so we have two and a half staff members, uh, a full time office manager who does everything. Um, and then we have a part time program in social media and kind of a catch all uh, position as well. And then I primarily write grants. So we are an incredible, we're a passer. Our, our typical budget is about $300,000. And then the last couple of years, it's been, you know, they've had some harder years and some nice fatty years as well. But it's, it's the average is about $300,000. But we may get in a year $650,000, but it all goes back out to arts and culture organizations in our region. And so we are a pass through and we are very trusted in that way um, and respected in that way. So we are, you know, right now we're applying for a total of $600,000 grants which we don't get a lot of. We just in turn give those to um, arts and culture groups in need, um, arts and culture groups with stellar capital plans, um, people who have plans to include the underserved. Um, that's that's what we do. We are a pass-through agency. So our budget may not reflect it, but we yeah, do, yeah. We do like handle some more dollars than that, but $300,000. Thank you, that answer. Yeah, you bet. And we use the city's money and we would use your funding as leverage because many of our grants are matching grants. So you can imagine it's really hard when you have a budget of three hundred thousand dollars to say, oh, we can match, we can match this grant for even if you wanted a million dollar grant for tons of public art or whatever, whatever it is, some creative wonderful thing, you have to match that. And so um, to get those sort of funds is is difficult. And so we use that is primarily how we use the city's funding is to match grants because it is so critical to us to live and to be able to um, provide what we provide, which is which is. Pretty happy service to you. Mary, as I recall, you do some fundraising too, do you not? Um, well, not since I've been there because it was it's been COVID. But yes, the um, it was called the Mayor's Arts Awards. Then it was the Rockford Area Arts Awards, which it will stay. Um, that is one of our fundraisers. Uh, we do Art Scene, which is a biannual um, gallery walk. So it's primarily in downtown Rockford, with a lot of galleries taking place all over the county. Um, and people have to apply for that and we provide promoting and supporting stuff. It's, it's not a lot of money. We do not make a lot of money on that, but we, we focus on promoting artists and their organizations and we don't, we don't do a lot of fundraising actually. We do not. So the $300,000 that it takes to operate the organization is currently coming as part of the grants that you receive? Membership. We're a membership organization. Okay. We're a little bit like Greenpeace. People can write us a check for 30 bucks as a, as a low member, as a low paying member, as just a basic membership. And then there are memberships and members who give you $1,000 um, because they believe in the impact of the arts. And so we, we go after those. We do uh, sponsorships. So sponsorships for somewhere like Art Scene, um, a program like that, sponsorships for summer programming, so that the grant is paying for the summer programming and then our sponsorships are paying for our time. Um, staff and, and keeping our budget right around 300,000 so that we can 
have a little cash in the bank for reserve. Okay. And your presence like outside of Rockford right now is, you mentioned some murals that you have. Are there other examples of things that you do say in Rockton sure. or Winnebago, just? All of our programs, so even just the gallery walk or the summer programs, they're all open to everybody in Winnebago County. We promote them to everybody in Winnebago County. Um, uh, it's easier to pick out the things that exclude people outside of the Rockford limits than it is to tell you. What well, why, why would you exclude people from outside of Rockford? Oh, if you write a grant and you have to focus on two zip codes and serve the underserved in those zip codes, it okay. happens with grant, grant funded agencies like ourselves. Um, you may you may have one program that specifically focuses on this neighborhood and these two zip codes, but then the rest of our summer programs are open to everybody. So you may have those things happen in you know in Winnebago County too. If we applied for a certain grant, it might say you'd have to serve rural and um, rural people in rural uh, towns and women. And so we okay, we'll do programs for you know rural residents and women. And so that's what that restrictive um, clause may be. But otherwise, all of our programs and all of our services are Winnebago County open. They are open to, um, we could probably better serve them with more marketing as well. So those are some things that, you know, funding, increased funding that we go for will help us do, whether or not we're funded by the county. I just think that in some of the communities outside of Rockford, should we move forward with giving you guys money that if we can have some tangible things that's, that tell them, okay, this is the things that, that this investment will bring right into your community, you know, mm -hmm. so I, public you know, art installation is, is yeah, one of the, the, and, yeah. yeah, and so if there's things that people can, you know, know is coming and then see it arrive, that would absolutely, you know, be absolutely. A good, I, I can easily, I know I've sent it to um, Chairman mm -hmm. Cheryl, like that list of things because he, he said the same thing. Um, and I thought I sent it to you in a letter as um, board members, but maybe not. So I will look at that and get it to you because there, it's a, it's an easy one. Um, but it's, we don't do a lot of, um, the Arts Council is, as an umbrella arts organization, we're almost like a, what United Way used to be as far as they're the umbrella human services organization. And so things pass through them and then they help other agencies do their jobs better. So people are already doing the jobs. We don't, we don't need to do them. We need to help fund them. Um, and it works out pretty well. Okay. Do you have a question? Uh, it was actually going to be a follow-up to yours, which then you followed up and got it answered. But I did have one other question. How long have you guys been uh, in operation? Oh, for 40. It was born in 1969, but it went through some name changes and some kind of function changes. They, a lot of arts councils used to be called arts and sciences, um, local arts agencies, and now they're called the Arts Council. But really active and vital, about 35 years, 40 years. And follow-up question to that is, uh, you know, knowing that we have so many of these arts uh, places and organizations already, and that you are the pass-through for that, uh, how did it become that? Because I'm, a, if I remember correctly, you guys were more involved with actual arts that were going on in the Rockford area at the time, instead of just being a pass-through in prior years, correct? Mm -hmm. Or is that? No, we've always been a pass-through organization. Always a pass-through? Yeah. And in that sense, I mean, I say pass through, that's not necessarily our identity, but we, we do pass through a lot of funds. Um, I think there are different leaders of organizations that have at times focused on RPS 205 and the Arts Council, that relationship. That is focused on, but it is not a priority in the sense that it takes over any other public school district. So we are not exclusive in that way. Um, we've worked quite a bit with private schools as well. Um, talking to the new Harlem um, School District, uh, not Dean, superintendent. but superintendent, thank you. And um, we plan to work together and um, have some plans in the, in the works. So I'm, we're, definitely, we're definitely reaching out and it's, it's an endorsement by somebody is, because the county and is influential. That would make a huge difference for us to have that legitimacy with these, with these um, organizations that are smaller and may not understand the resources available. Um, yeah, last answer. follow up. Yeah. Okay. And with RACBB doing so many different promotions arts wise and also being basically a pass through as well, how does what they do really have you guys tied that in together or how do they differ from what you do? I know that they do more as far as uh, not just uh, focusing on the arts, they, they're obviously the, the uh, Visitors and Convention Bureau. However, they've been so, I guess, involved. They've come to us quite a few times as far as arts goes. 
So just in kind of a general description, why would you differ that up? I would say that in the last three to five years, the RACDB, and we've had long conversations, John would agree with this, has picked up what the Arts Council was not doing. And so what you saw coming from the RACDB in destination development is something that the Arts Council was not doing at the time with the leadership that they had. So without, you know, knowing a lot or, you know, knowing what I do know and, and not thinking that it's important to um, not divulge, but leadership changes. And that leadership at that time was not as aggressive with public art installments and creative place making and space making. And so it fell into the lap of John because John's a go getter and he thinks, ah, well, if nobody's doing this, we'll do it. And so he did do it. And so now he's making us a collaborator and in some of the realms that we've been working um, together, he's already handed off things to us because he said, this is really your job. Um, in your role in the community. So there's not anything duplicitous going on, that's for sure. Um, and we are certainly serving um, people through summer programs, through Poetry Out Loud school programs. I'm sorry, I don't know what's happening here. Um, that John is not. So very different roles. But also collaborative. Huh? Yeah. Um, and are you, um, are you a bona fide nonprofit? And that's all what you does in nature. Yes, 501c3. Okay. Yep. Are there any members on Zoom that would like to ask a question? Does anyone else have any more questions? No, it's a wonderful organization that you all should truly support. Um, Mary, are you part of a group, or is it the John Grove that's putting up uh, art all over town uh, as far as statues and, and different pieces of artwork, um, sculptures and all this? Are you part of that, or is that basically John that does that? Yes. Um, John began those mural installations just two years ago, actually, um, when I was not at the Arts Council. And uh, the sculpture installments as well, maybe four years ago. And we are now part of the mural installation and we will work toward being part of the sculpture installation. So we, by that, I mean, we will work on the funding with John to do that because really what John does is pay, he does what we do. He, he gets enough money to do those things and then it goes into those things. And that's that's where the money goes. There's, there's no other extra pockets for us in our budget. That is where they go. Um, yeah, so we are part of both of those movements. Um, one is a formal partner and the other one is a collaborative partner. And we will look toward doing much more collaboratively. We've in fact talked about partnering up in a number of ways. So I can see that moving forward, it's a stronger coalition together, certainly. But John's connection to the arts and culture community is not uh, as strong as the Arts Council. We've built that over 40 years and, and that is our area. That's our area of expertise. So when we need to reach out to um, groups that are not your typical groups at the table, we, we're we are the expertise in that area. Those artists and those uh, culture organization, cultural organizations, we are familiar with and are members and are invested in the communities that they live in, both inside and outside. So how many counties would you be working with? Four. Four. Four is our is our formal, but many arts councils that I talk to have the one county where their urban hub is, and that is where they serve primarily. The other counties are really primarily rural, and so we will um, send them all of our information ask them for um, feedback and if they'd like to be included on our website, those sorts of things. Many of their arts organizations are all volunteer run. And so we will put up anything that they have and promote anything, support it in any way that we can, but they don't have a lot of formal um, no, they don't. steps no. in, in their structure, I should say, in their organizations. But they do start to participate with us uh, through their county. Would, we, would you be asking them for a fee also? Oh, yes, yes. I would just want to know what, what we've done well here for Winnebago County and then move on and duplicate that with another county. I just think that we need to start here and make sure that we are strong and that you are seeing those results as uh, Winnebago County leaders, that you are seeing our presence. And I hope that it's even, um, even as I leave this meeting, that it's almost like the hospital sign that you don't really see those signs on the uh, roads until you need the hospital. And then all of a sudden you see all the H's. I'm hoping you see that a little bit more with the Arts Council, just me coming here and saying, we are here, we are serving the county. This is what we do, but you may not know in what role we play. So I would be happy to do that. I'd be happy to come, you know, a couple times a year and tell you what we're doing and how we're serving you. Um, 
any in any capacity you would like to see. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure if we do, you know, partner with you, we would appreciate those reports. Yeah, so I love that. that would be beneficial to everybody. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. That was very informative. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thank you for your help. Appreciate it. And then downstairs, is it just down to 401 and, and I should have a problem? Yeah, it's not locked to go out. It's okay. Just, yeah. All okay. right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your time. Okay. Let me just pull up my agenda here. Bradley, Mark, you have the invocation and pledge this week. Um, awards. So Donna Hansel receiving an award, recognition for receiving an award. We're gonna have a land bank uh, update by Gary Anderson. Um, proclamations, Festa Italian, Italiana Days, and uh, Rockford's Italian Sister City. And Chairman Service Award presented to Paul Logley. Um, Appointments. Uh, Kevin McCarthy appointed to the River Bluff Advisory Committee. Uh, Finance Committee. Um, do we, there's nothing, nothing on the agenda. I don't. Unfinished business. Mr. Schultz. Yes. What's that? Three items. Oh, and under unfinished business. Yep. Right, go ahead, Mr. Salgado. Go ahead. Yeah, the three items we already kind of been discussing for a couple of weeks now. The one is the the courts. Uh, uh, they got a grant for twenty one k, give or plus or minus, for uh, technology. Um, so they got a grant. So it's just uh, um, margin uh, budget neutral on that. Then we got the twenty million dollar, obviously for the art money for phase one that we've been talking about um, for the past three weeks or so. And then finally, um, there's the rental assistant, a uh, part two, I wanna say it's 2.5, $2.3 million. Um, that's kind of like a budget amendment for that. So those are the three items that have been laid over and we're just taking a vote on it uh, this coming uh, board meeting. Um, Mr. Salgado, did you get the uh... The amendments to the art budget that um, Mr. Ricker. No, I have together. not seen those amendments. Uh, they shared them with Mr. Hoffman and myself earlier today. Mr. Hoffman, do you want to go over those? Do you want me to sort of pass them around? Uh, so, are we happy to get? Uh, yeah. Okay. So the changes that are going to be made from what was presented to us last is um, the animal services portion of the allocation will be reduced by $450,000. Um, the circuit clerk microfilm scanning solution, um, this is uh, an addition of $680,305. $608,305. It, um, this was something that we were told was originally requested and got left out by a, an error in the um, first budget. So it's not really a change. It's just an addition of something that I guess should have been there in the first place. Um, the uh, emergency operating center technology refresh, um, of an addition of 290 uh, four hundred sixteen dollars. This is um, for uh, deficiencies that they discovered during the response to uh, the chem tool fire. Uh, the state's attorney's office um, for the, uh, uh, the the stuff that 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 state's attorney Hanley discussed at the meeting. I think he calls it intelligent prosecution, or I, I can't remember the, the terminology, but four hundred thirty-eight thousand dollars to fund that um, effort for two years. And then a reduction in the contingency um, allocation. Um, of the reduction amount is 
$58,721, um, leaving, leaving a contingency amount of $3,083,141. So those are the changes that they're going to bring forward on uh, on Thursday. Does anyone have any questions about that? Okay. Who's pushing uh, through the amendment? Uh, who's th pushing through the amendment on the floor? Well, this is this. I don't know. We guess we didn't get that far, but um, I, I assume um, they would probably ask you to do it or whoever, but. Um, I guess we, we talked about, I made the request on the floor to fund the state's attorney. So we talked about that. The other ones, I guess, are based on conversations that took place after right. the presentation. What, what's uh, what's the 400, the 480 for the state's attorney? Uh, you said the intel, intelligent, whatever, software or whatever. Yeah. Um, oh, that, so, it's, so, so, so it's not. No, it's, it's, it's not. So it's not uh, to hire additional prosecutors, correct? It's, it is to hire additional prosecutors, but Mr. Ricker told me today that they would not be, it, it funds it for two years and then it ends. So there's no you know, legacy cost. It's like once, once the funding ends, then those- All right, I just end. wanna make sure uh, once again on the floor that there is no legacy cost and if we have, we factored in a way to fund those positions if uh, once the funding is completely gone. Um, he, he said that to me today that there was no legacy cost and that they end. And if there's some specific language that we need to include to ensure it's that way, we should maybe touch base with them tomorrow to make sure that it's in there. Yeah, I'll, I'll wait for the, hopefully they'll send those amendments electronically and then I'll reach out to them. Okay, so so that's what came of that on the uh, on the ARP funding or not the the ERAP funding. This um, second set of money has less strict um, guidance, so it should be easier for us to allocate the funds. The um, governor has allowed eviction filings to begin August first, and the courts. Um, the Supreme Court put a stay on um, proceeding with the case during the month of August so that they could refer anyone who files a case to these programs. So I'm hoping, you know, I've talked to Mr. Rickard, to Suzanne Fanstock and the, the manager of the program, and I believe she's talking to the courts <clears throat> about trying to make sure that those referrals, we, we, we flag them as coming from the courts and uh, try to use this less restrictive funding source so that it gets moved through faster than the others might. So I just wanted to mention that on that program. Uh, does anyone else have any questions or comments for finance? Uh, Mr. Tassoni. Yeah, uh, um, I guess in the timing, just um, is there is there hundred percent confidence that all these monies that are allocated in this round of funds that it is, it is okay to use them for that, we're not, not going to come back on us and say, nah, you couldn't use it for that or whatever. That might happen. That they're hiring Baker Tilly to review everything. They're like audit it and make sure it falls in the categories and all that. So we probably wouldn't spend money until we get that audit or whatever. That, that's correct. Each item by item, it's supposed to be checked. Mm -hmm. And also, they said it's going to come back to us for approval on individual expenditures through our normal purchasing process. This is just like the preliminary. Approved. Yeah, it's like, yeah. Is that correct, Mr. Salgado? Yeah, so essentially we're allocating $20 million based on the particulars um, that were discussed. I want to say like the 3 million for the squad cards, the 3 million for the um, what we know already with uh, Lori Gaumau, um for the voting machines, the contingency, the revenue, obviously, uh, lost that we've lost. All those categories have been kind of vetted out through uh, Baker Tilly and uh, determine whether it's been, it classifies as allowable or not allowable. Anything not allowable obviously would not come back to us on this. So right now it's that $20 million budget that we're allocating those funds for those particular sections, areas that 
you know, have been note, notated and kind of discussed about, uh, except for the additional, I want to say two or three items, the reduction in animal services and then the state's attorney. And then there was one more out there. Those, I'm pretty confident that those have been vetted out as being determined as allowable costs to be used on the first wave of the money. So um, there is that control. And then obviously Baker Tilly is kind of sitting back and making sure that those, those items uh, qualify ver um, based on the guidance that the Treasury Department has given us um, and you know on what we can expend the money for. So, um, so confidence 100%, I wouldn't say, you know, nothing's perfect, but I would say 98 plus, we're pretty confident that they follow within those categories that would obviously, uh, we would have no issue if uh, they were to come back and say, prove it to us that it does follow under these guidances. So that's how we kind of assure for that. And I mean, and I sort of talk to leaders or whoever was on the committee. Has, has there been some discussion, or can I at least ask that maybe the board has a bit more input other than nothing as far as the preliminary allocations of the next fund? Um, you know, maybe, maybe we compile somewhat of a list. Yes. So, so my understanding is that. The only piece right now that kind of has been set aside right now is that 20 million, right? Which is kind of our capital uh, projects that we're kind of had on loom. And majority of it is, uh, a lot of it is IT, you know, as we see it in there. Um, but anything relating to like the neighborhoods, anything relating to public safety, anything relating to uh, the law center that, you know, obviously those are the things with the PSB. Uh, building those things right there still need to be allocated. Uh, uh, administration's taking a list um, and kind of going through uh, departments to get their um, their professional expertise on how much money allocations here and there. Um, primarily, though, the neighborhood um, is the key for county board members to kind of um, you know provide input on certain areas that the, the county needs that support, you know, uh, whether it's community projects that are out there within, you know, their districts, whatever the case may be. Uh, you've heard Miss Red last um, County of the Hold, there's things on the west side, south side that she wants, you know, kind of to attract. So if it does fall within those guidelines, um, based on what the Treasury Department has provided, um, certainly those things can go on the list. But nothing has been set in stone to say this is the next batch or whatever the next money is going to be, and these are the allocations. Uh, the twenty million is the only one for sure that's kind of been set aside. But anything going forward, you know, re uh, reach out to Mr. Rickert, Mr. Thompson. Um, you know, once again, they're going through that list of the goals, objectives that we kind of sat down and said, what were the most important things for a county. Uh, a lot of it was economic development and so forth. Um, so they're taking that information, kind of running with that. But obviously, you know, board has input to provide any detail um, or questions regarding, you know, where some of this funding should go. And so that's where we're kind of in that stage now is trying to figure out what are the next uh, phases, you know, how are we going to tackle that more broadly and how can we use those funds appropriately? And then obviously with input of the county board and the administrative staff and the departments as a whole. So, um, so there is no, you know, uh, where the permanent list is gonna go for what's certain areas, sections right now. That's what we're trying right now. That's the next step for administration to kind of roll with that and obviously get the input from county board members. I don't know if that answers your question, Mr. Tosoni. Just as a follow-up to what Mr. Tosoni asked, uh, Jaime, do you know is the next set, uh, next set um, of the monies that are coming in, are that is there going to be more of the money that's going to be coming towards economic development? Uh, a lot of the businesses in the area were actually wondering along those lines, um, especially if there was going to be more monies designated to them and operations and trying to rehire and with the troubles that they're having with hiring right now as it is. So uh, just wondering if there was going to be more funding that way. 
Yeah, so right now, just uh, so we're clear on what has transpired, um, the first set of money has come in, I want to say 27 point something has come in, 27.5, I believe. The next one that we'll see the next 27 and a half, it's going to be a year from now. So my my estimating calculation from just doing rough math here, if we're allocating 20, that lives us about $7 million right now that we can obviously uh, work with, um, you know, within the short term from now into a year for now until we get the additional funding uh, for the additional $27 million for the second set of money coming through. So just, just wanted to throw it out there. Uh, is there talks about economic development? Um, certainly there is with the neighborhoods uh, phase. Um, that's a discussion that internally Mr. Rickert and uh, Chairman Shirelli and uh, Mr. Thompson are having those discussions right now. But it's something that, it, for example, your committee decides, hey, you know, uh, we're, I'm hearing, you know, across the board that, you know, economic development for small businesses, whatever local businesses are struggling. Uh, is there a way that we can, you know, use this money to provide that support? Obviously, one of the biggest things is the rental assistant, which has, you know, is part of the art money, but it's totally separate from, from that. It's being used to support that aspect of it, right? So I wouldn't see why there wouldn't be a huge issue to potentially use some of that for economic development, but I can't speak for the whole county board, right? So um, it's something that we can put on our priority list that we can look at. And I've kind of mentioned this at the floor. You know, we need to obviously prioritize what we think are really the needs for the community as a whole and that they fall within, you know, that guidance or from the Treasury Department that we can use those and obviously be vetted from our, our, our auditors to make that determination whether it's legitimately um, that we can use that money for whether it's, you know, economic development, you know, for revenue losses for local businesses and stuff like that, that has to be uh, still vetted out, but something that we can obviously put out there um, as a priority list within, obviously, the majority of the county board has discretion on how those funds are spent out. So, um, and, and I, all I can say is that it's, everything's on the table right now. Um, as long as it falls within that, those categories and, and also is vetted out that it's allowable, you know, to be spent on. So um, I can't answer your question, how much or what are we looking at and uh, trying to provide economic development, that boost for local businesses, but it's something we can talk about and obviously figure out if, you know, we can truly, truly set aside money for, you know, those types of purposes that we're trying to do. Yep, thank you, Hyman. Okay. Are there any other comments or questions for finance? Okay. Hearing none, we will move on to zoning. Uh, I don't believe there's anything on the zoning committee. If I recall, Mr. Webster said it wasn't going to meet for a while, right? So uh, we'll move on then to economic development. <coughs> Oh, yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for economic development, we did have three different resolutions. Uh, the first one being a resolution abating property taxes on property located at 707 Fulton Avenue, uh, Rockford, Illinois. That's uh, known as the Ingersoll Real Estate. And that's actually in regards to the discussions that have been had. Uh, that's for that uh, telescope installation that they had. And it's just the tax abatement. Uh, the city has already abated. Um, we're not the only ones abating. It's the city. Uh, park district, school district, and us as well. And uh, the city, I believe, has already passed theirs. And park district and school district, uh, I believe one of them has already passed it already. And then they're waiting on the last one, but um, we're one of the other ones that they're waiting on for the abatement. Um, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Uh, can you just speak to the duration and what the bottom of it? Uh, I don't know. Actually, I don't think I, I have it in my other notebook. But I remember I listened it was, to the meeting. Yeah. 10 years. Right 10 now. years. Yeah. And it's staged like mm -hmm. 100%. It's tiered, but it's only on the new construction portion. Right. Okay. So it's not on the whole property. It is only based on the new construction and it's tiered over 10 years. And I believe the last five years were like 25%. Yeah, only. But the total value of it was, if I remember correctly, it was like $60,000. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. oh, from our end. Yeah. Yeah. 
annually or producing no, over the 10 years. That's what I thought the whole yeah. Thing. Yeah. So we, we should confirm that, but that's just yeah. I'll give you the exact number on Thursday, but I didn't know if it was between because uh, they had originally discussed eight years, so I didn't know if it was going to be the eight or the ten. I believe it was the ten, though. Yeah, I was just listening in, so yeah. I could have um, the next resolution would be uh, sorry, resolution authorizing uh, participation in abandoned residential property municipal relief program grant, and that's a grant that we got uh, to aid in uh, the demolition as well as the maintenance. Uh, one of the things in this grant is actually Mr. Arena so uh, graciously reminded me and actually was pointed out that it is actually not just, it doesn't have to only be used towards demolitions. Uh, I did mention at the committee that we would actually hold another committee meeting to have discussions, which will be open to other board members. So that way we can actually open up the floor for discussions on possible other programs that we can have to more so try to get those properties off of our hands. Uh, try to just maintain them for a short period of time, but then try to get them off of our hands into somebody's hands that they can actually renovate if it does have a good structure behind it. So some of them that have been condemned, that was the question that a lot of people arose was, what was it based off of? And it's mostly based on a health portion of it, which if it had flooding or something like that, it automatically would qualify as a, con, a, a possible condemned building, even though if it was a easy repair. So that's something that me, start, me and Mr. Arena were talking about, and we will be hosting another committee meeting to discuss it at length. That's for the whole county? That would be for the whole county. That was the other- Isn't it for only areas that are unincorporated? The on, only areas that are unincorporated, yeah. Right. And, and I, <clears throat> so the, the point I saw is that the, it doesn't have to just be used for demolition where it appears historically we have, and when I looked at the criteria they use for what they decide to demolish, I didn't necessarily agree that that criteria um, absolutely means that the building isn't salvageable from Mr. Village's mm -hmm. point that, you know, if we can use some of this funds for maintenance and clean it up a little bit and get it in someone else's hands, that's good. But beyond that, what I think in his next meeting, what we have to do is look at that criteria. And I think high on that priority list is will somebody take the land after we demo the property? Because when we take uh, a property and demo it, and then it comes into our trustee program and nobody wants that lot, we're stuck with it. But it's in, with $75,000, you only can do like maybe five or six demos. Mm -hmm. So out of this whole county, if we're telling people, oh, if you don't want that house, you know, we'll take it down, but you have to agree to take the land or you and your neighbors have to split the land. And then we'll um, replat it and make it into one property, and, you know, tie it into another parcel. Well, we might have to absorb some of those costs, but we have to balance that expense against the expense of maintaining the property indefinitely, because, you know, a lot of these five hundred dollar lots, people aren't buying, and we just have them in our inventory in that program. And it's costing us a lot of money to travel to actually maintain all of them. They're useless lots. They're, they're not buildable lots. What we're, what the problem with. So what we're discussing with this portion of it, where, where it's directed towards, is actually maintain is actually going towards maintaining those properties that actually have properties on it, because it's actually a grant that we get for actually doing the demolitions and maintenance of a property that has an existing structure. So this isn't towards those small little slivers on a map that nobody wanted because the neighbor doesn't want to mow the grass or uh, whatever it may be, even though the I did look into the uh, let's put it this way, the adjustment in their taxes that it would be if they were to actually take on that land is literally within between 10 to 100 bucks, depending on the size of the property. It's really nothing pennies on the dollar if you look at it that way. However, some people are not are less likely to want to take those little slivers of land only based on the fact that they know that the county right now has to drive all the way out there and maintain, maintain that portion of it so they don't have to do it. While they can still utilize it, for example, if their kids decide to play football on it or soccer or whatever it is, they still end up usually parking something on there or whatever it may be or however they may use it. That's the issue that we've been running into over the last few years. So with the trustee program, it's supposed to attack getting rid of those properties as much as possible. But this program is more towards the properties that already have existing uh, uh, structures on them. So it's just a matter of making sure that when we tear something down, that there's an, like a, a plan for the you know, end result. That it's not just we tear down a, a a dilapidated house and create an uncared for lot. Yeah. It's it's not for lots, it's for abandoned properties. 
<clears throat> I think the people want it down, and in, to get it down, they had to agree to take the land. Eventually, somebody will take the land. And if they don't agree, that house just sits there forever. Well, I guess that's a problem that we can, uh, you know, address as we come to it. But if we're only doing six or seven in a year with the size of this county. I think that of those six and seven, we can pick six or seven properties that someone will take the land. And one of the, you're bringing up a good point of an, another problem, but where it's possible for us not to create a new, you know, an additional problem for us, I think we should. And one of the one of the things that I discussed with uh, Ms. Stormbush and actually under previous administration with other uh, uh, administrators, actually one of my biggest concerns was when we were discussing uh, the trustee program and switching over, as well as doing the uh, land bank. One of my biggest concerns too at that time, because we brought up the discussion about the abandoned properties and we brought up the discussion of dilapidated properties and that being our main focus of focusing on. One of my concerns with it was when they were selling off those little slivers of land that certain people didn't want, uh, a big question that I brought up was, can is there a program that we can set up? Because we don't have a program that exists right now, but I would like to bring up a program that exists that it would take, for example, the, some of these properties that um, are zoned within the city, they may not meet new or current zone requirements for rebuilding a new building or a new house. So if it's just going to be an empty plot of land and you're having an issue with basically the person just doesn't want to take on that land, but if you describe to them how it's going to raise and increase their value and then give them an abatement, we abate taxes for businesses day in, day out. Uh, I mean, not everyone, but I mean, for the most part, we've ab uh, abated businesses taxes so that they either they can expand or they would stay in the area. Why wouldn't we abate taxes for, let's say, for example, an empty plot of land for a resident residential plot of land for let's say the neighbor to be able to take on that property for 10 years, they don't have to pay the added amount that it would be on the taxes. And again, like I said, if even if you're looking at a hundred dollars a year difference in your property taxes over 10 years, that's a thousand bucks. So it cost us all of a thousand bucks that we weren't getting on this emptier piece of property, but we just actually uh, raised the EAV of that current property by expanding their land portion. So that's something that I've actually brought up before. We've never, it's never come to fruition, though. Uh, well, it was just like you mentioned, you know, some of the lots aren't conforming to today's standards, but um, has there been much talk with whether it be schools that want to build a house or habitat or humanity that it's not that our building told that maybe we don't even have them build new houses? Have there been conversations mm -hmm. with this particular thing, you know? Or? That would be a question for, I think uh, our one's going to come in soon and talk to us about the trustee program, but that would be and something to bring up that know that the, the areas would all be fitting to build a, a newer home and all that. And we should, excuse me, but I should say, we'll say, um, like he says about the legacy talks for mowing and everything. Right. Uh, should we give them an incentive that will pay to take it? Yeah. You know, which which is thing. which is why I mentioned the tax abatement you because know. if you're abating them a hundred dollars a year worth of difference in their taxes and they're taking on this you know bigger portion of their property making their property bigger adding value to their property and over time obviously they're going to be able to sell or whatever it may be but for us it's costing us well over a hundred dollars a year just to be able to mow that piece of property so I think that would be very good incentive to tell them hey look we'll help you raise your property value. And all you have to do in turn is just mow it. And, and our numbers of the, the vacant and dwellings. It would disappear almost. Yeah. yeah. Um, Ms. Corp. When it comes to habitat and um, and building, like the school building houses, they really have to be on, on uh, public water and sewer. They can't be built back on um, wells and septics because of the cost. So really those lots have to be within a municipality wherever it's at. Okay. Well, it'll be something that Mr. Phillips's committee will which is, up. Yeah, which is why I actually wanted to follow up with another committee meeting to actually discuss those topics as well. Uh, and the last resolution that we had, which was uh, a resolution approving greenways, a greenways plan for Boone, Ogle, and Winnebago counties. Um, and that uh, got approved as well. Um, Description on that one would be actually. Um, I ask a question on that one. Has that improved at all over the years? Because we had one of these plans. Right, we do it every five years. 
It's the yeah, it's the same same description of a plan. It has to be updated every five years. We have to pass a resolution. Okay. So it, it's it's to keep going on with the plan that we well, not the plan that was last year. Obviously, it's been either added or some of the topics were obviously addressed that so that way they're not the issue anymore. So we did have a presentation of what the plan is going to look like now. Um, and and it, it is in our packet as well. So what it is, is it's actually just a plan describing what our future is gonna look like with the greenways and what we anticipate them to become or how to become. I had a question. question. Go ahead. Yeah, just wondering, Jazz, could you help me understand how does that greenways plan interact with the 2030 land use plan? Uh, actually, that's a great question. We asked that during committee and it actually interacts very closely. Uh, the zoning department as well uses a lot of things that were found within the greenways plan that actually tied in together, not just with the 2030 land use plan, but also uh, um, tying into, uh, if you remember the, uh, not, not restrictions, what are they called? Um, the areas that we actually address when discussing different zonings for zoning board or for zoning committee. Um, the Greenways plan actually helped us create those questions as well and those requirements to actually meet those uh, uh, standards. That's the word I was looking for. You're listening very well because when we did the 23 plan, uh, the Greenways plan was also involved in it at that time too, where it would be, you know, and so we worked around with that also. Mm -hmm. So that was in the 2030 plan to start with. Correct. And Mr. Webster can verify that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions for economic development? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to operations. Mr. McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We've got one resolution uh, adopting procedures for remote meeting attendance pursuant to the Illinois Open Meeting Act. Uh, I believe it passed unanimously. It's pretty much moving everybody back in person for the meeting. That's nice that it lays out the rules and regulations. No guessing. But there is provisions in there for, for somebody has a medical issue or a family emergency that you can still uh, call in or participate remotely. It's really not much different than 2018. I'm working on a bathroom running late. That doesn't qualify. No, I'm sorry. You <laughs> <laughs> have to cut yourself. I have a medical have, emergency. Have, <laughs> have, have you call in Hawkin and Weeson and say I'm sorry that it all? I've done that since I worked for the city. <laughs> <laughs> I assume that's a little trouble between you and him. Uh, and then uh, the item that's in the uh, on operations uh, is not ready correct and get laid over so i have a question <laughs> this is dorothy dorothy red i have a question go ahead dorothy red i have a question go ahead. Go ahead. this is my opinion with COVID back on the rise do you think it's wise to move forward to bring us all back in person All of the uh, states, I understand, is on the rise. With people, the COVID. My vaccinations and, and social. Yeah. I'm not going to try it again. <laughs> Go ahead, Dorothy. This is just an opinion, and I have a question for the committee. With COVID okay. on the rise again, in all 50 states, do you think it's wise to come back to bring everyone back? into a public meeting? Uh, my personal opinion is that people are vaccinated, who are vaccinated are safe. So it's the only people who are um, at risk are people who are making a, a choice um, themselves in which they're entitled to do. Um, and so my personal do, opinion- do you, do, you, do you think that all the county board members have been vaccinated? Uh, I have, and what everyone else decides to do is their personal decision. But I don't know, does anyone else want to weigh in on that? Dorothy, I think if, if I, in our state right now, we, if you read it, we've been holding really good. If at all, at any time, all of a sudden, I, 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 I'm not even guessing at this, I'm 
I believe if we all of a sudden have a great big influx again of the problem, then we would go back to the way we come out of, of being quarantined and the whole thing. But we at this in the state of Illinois, especially us on the upper part of the state, we don't seem to have that problem right now. If that problem ever got huge again, like it is in other states, then we would probably have to go back to the way of of holding a different way of holding our meetings like we've had the last few years. Who's you know, speaking uh, for your name? Who was that speaking? It was Angie Just, Goral. Oh, okay. Thank and, you. And Mr. Mr. Sony would like a comment. Go ahead, Mr. Sony. Yeah, I'll give you my two cents on it. Um, I mean, typically the, the guidance now is if you haven't been vaccinated, you should wear a mask. Uh, in my personal opinion, in my personal life, I'm vaccinated. I don't care if you are or you aren't. I'm done with it. I'm over with it. And I'll get a shot when they tell me to need another shot. That's how I feel. And, and also, I want to comment that this uh, proposal says that if you have a medical issue, you can participate remotely. So if any member of this board feels that they're, you know, have a, you know, a medical concern related to COVID or anything else, you're still permitted to, to participate remotely. With of, permission of the chairman. With permission of the chairman, correct. Right, because a lot of people who have asthma can't get the shot. And so not everyone, uh, you can't, 100% you'll never have because 100% of the people truly cannot have it. They have certain um, diseases or uh, allergies that they are not going to be able to have that, that shot. So we have to learn to live with them too and respect them and try to keep them healthy so we can stay healthy. Just because we have the shots doesn't mean we can't get to COVID because we can. But it's just like pneumonia. You have a pneumonia shot, you have a measles shot, doesn't mean you can't get it. It just means you'll have a lighter case of it and you'll get through it a lot easier. Right. Uh, Mr. Tassoni? Yeah, and, and I, I'll just let the, the office here know some of my frustration some of my frustration is having to do a roll call vote on every on every item we do that adds to a very lengthy meeting. And you know, in the legislation and the order from the governor regarding Zoom and in person, it specifically says it must be clear, audible, and everybody must be able to hear. I opted to tune into our uh, meeting of the whole last week only because I thought I would just be listening, and I listened to it for an hour and a half, and I didn't hear anything. And if anybody else was on Zoom, and I believe Dorothy made comment about it as well, but I mean, it specifically says there must be clear audio and people are supposed to be able to hear. And that doesn't happen. You know, there's been a few that were okay, but last week was absolutely terrible. And I, I don't know, I didn't really hear nothing. What they need, I'll tell you what they need is a big uh, sound bar. Because, <laughs> no, I'm serious, I'm serious. I'm serious. Because these flat screen TVs don't have any speakers on the front. They all come from behind and it's muffled. And so if you have a sound bar, that comes out so nice and clear because you can hear the whole thing. It's in front of the, the television. And if you have better, con I don't know, it just works out. <clears throat> well, I would just say that I've, I've been, we've been through this before about various things about people not hearing and being confused and whatever it else it is. But let it come to some zoning matter or some public participation that they can't do because the Zoom meeting was inaudible. We'll get sued over it because we got that's happened in the past mm -hmm. on in person things because the guy couldn't hear. And if one other thing to consider, Dorothy, is that the governor's order is going to expire on the 24th or the 28th or something like that. And I think it's, it's the 24th. Okay, but it's his order that lets us meet by Zoom. So once his order expires, we couldn't do it at all unless we pass the ordinance that Mr. McDonald has brought forward that creates exceptions to the Open Meetings Act. So this is actually a better scenario than doing nothing. If you want to have an opportunity to <clears throat> meet remotely at all. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, is there any other comments or questions for operations? Okay, hearing none. 
What's up next? Uh, public works, Mr. Sony. Uh, public works, we have uh, five items. Um, uh, one is, uh, for anybody that's up in that auction area though, there was a one uh, resolution 21-019, uh, it's a resolution authorizing the work of bid for a three paving of Rockton uh, Road up there between Sherland and Rockton. It's a cost for 1.2 million. Uh, it was awarded to Rock Road. Uh, and it's going to start soon, sooner than later. Um, that was a portion of the road up there where last year the county went in under their own manpower and uh, equipment, widened it three or four feet on each side of the road and put down some, some underlayment pavement. And now they're coming in to do a whole five mile stretch of all repaving. And it, it is pretty bad up in that area. Um, next one, 21 020. The resolution authorizing the board of a bid for uh, culvert replacements on Lakeland Road uh, between Meridian and Owen Center, uh, $49,000. That was awarded to, uh, uh, it's a plumbing company, I forget the name of it. It's a plumbing company that is an affiliate of a, a large excavation company. Yeah, they just happen to have, it's a subsidiary of a, a larger you know, group of people that are branching off. So you might see that uh, it was like to say some, I don't know, John Plumbing, Joe's Plumbing, whoever it was, I could tell you right there. Because it came across as, wow, that's kind of strange. And uh, you'll see it. Let me see, Resolution or something. What is it? What is it? What is it? What does it say on my Facebook right there? But when you see it, it was worried about a plumbing company, and it's a subsidiary of a large excavation company. So they are experiencing that kind of work. Uh, the next item is a resolution uh, awarding a local public agency agreement amendment number one for federal participation. And this is basically for the Alpine Road Bridge, which we, we did vote now a few months ago. But the, uh, the federal government is giving us an additional $500,000 because of the increase in cost for the scope of the work. Uh, no additional cost to the county, but uh, this is just a, a an updated agreement because they're giving us another 500,000 and believe this. Uh, the next is an ordinance uh, establishing speed zone on Hamburg Road. Um, it's up in County Board District 4 and 7, no cost. Um, there was a study done and I think it's going from 45 to 35 up in that area on that stretch. Burfield Road, uh, Belvedere Road. Uh, the next item is a resolution uh, award for a uh, Two new wheel unloaders, five year lease each. They come with a three year uh, maintenance program and, and warranty, I believe, on. Uh, and it's uh, $45,000 a year for five years. We had a presentation from the highway department there that the, uh, the cost and repairs and maintenance on these vehicles is getting up there and uh, it's well needed. And uh, I think they have one that they'll be, they'll be selling with one of them that they're replacing. Uh, are there any questions for Mr. Sony? Just a two wheel loader. Two, two big oh, huge loaders. I thought the same thing. Two, Thank you. Two, <laughs> two, Is that a bicycle, right? You guys have two cycles with a shovel. <laughs> two big tracks for the highway. Two big tracks for the highway. Well, I was reading what it said. You read it right. I did hear something. It's a big track. Okay. Mr. Billich. Uh, not a question, more of a comment. Uh, good job to Dave to somebody in the highway department because uh, as they were doing the construction on the bridge, I actually have a few friends that work for the companies that are working on that. And uh, they were kind of filling me in on how dangerous that bridge had actually become. Had we not shut it down and started doing that construction, all the patchwork that they that we recently done a few years back just to push it off a few more years was about to give out. So we actually addressed it at the right exact time and it was pretty scary, they said so. Well, I think I did see something, national news maybe, or a report that out of the umpteen million failed bridges and broke, I don't know, it's like one of the worst, mm -hmm. you know, top 10 or, or whatever of four bridges and in infrastructure. But yeah, it's quite the project because I drive through there all the time. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, very uh, detailed, I guess, extensive. All right, um, moving on then, uh, public safety and judiciary, anything uh, coming up? Uh, no legislation this week to vote on, but we will have two presentations. One's gonna be from uh, Deb Jarvis, Director of uh, Court Services to kind of give us an update. 
on the Rick Center and also on youth probation. Kind of fill us in on what's going on, what are some of the services that we're doing now. Um, it was kind of brought up before that we weren't, you know, what was the, what are we doing for youth and everything. So this will be a, a beneficial kind of informational um, presentation from her, just kind of give us an update on that. Then also we'll have an update from Marlena Dockin on the focus insurance reentry program. So that sounds, you know, from what I've heard, this program two years ago was really doing a great job, but she lost the grant funding from it. So this will give those resources back to the folks that are coming out of uh, Department of Corrections that are moving back into this area. Uh, that way they, they'll have an advocate that actually works with them to make sure that they're going to the meetings, making sure that they either have a ride or whatever it may be, that the resources that they need to uh, get by and not reoffend are there for them. So it's really important. And also it does put some of the offenders in different categories. So you have high risk individuals coming out of DOC that are more than likely to reoffend and they would not be integrated into the lower offenders that may only have been in there for auto theft or something small. So you don't make career criminals with the career criminals and they have a better chance. So you, there is that separation there and she'll discuss that. So um, also Deb, if she has time, Ms. Jarvis, she'll kind of fill us in on some of the things that are gonna be impactful in the courts with the new reform bill. So if we have time for that, so we might fit that in. If not, we'll have another meeting with her and uh, chief judge just on that. On the court side of it. On the court side of it. Right. So I'm gonna to try to touch a little bit of everything do this hopefully in the next two months. I'm still very interested in hearing from someone, advocates for the crime bill talking mm -hmm. about the change in trespassing. And that I'm trying to set up for next month. So. Okay, that'd be great. Yep. Did you see Sunny's paper from page? Uh, we should all be very proud. And we should be even prouder. Because it talked about um, the, the police officers and the people from Rosecrans who right, will be going yeah. into our jail. And uh, when they go out on call, I don't ever want to see a whole squat team in front of my house again because the guy across the street is, is acting out. And this is going to be a real relief. I think you're going to find that a lot of um, action between police and people who are in, in crisis uh, taken care of. And I was so proud to see that, Tim. And if you haven't cut it out and put it on a board in front of you, because that's something we've waited for for a long time. Mm -hmm. right. And that's, you know, and the training that's going to go into that. So thank you for, for passing that and giving that grant out to, I believe it was Mar uh, uh, Marlena. The Rose Currents. And you're going to do a presentation of all the allocations from the Mental Health Board, right? Uh, we've missed the opportunity to have the uh, board get on. Um, to get on for this meeting, um, but we were going to see if we, if the board wouldn't mind getting an email with all the allocations on there. They, they, today in the chairman's meeting, they said that they were, were going to have you do that during the announcements and communications at this meeting. All right, so it's that's okay too. I mean, I just have them there, but they didn't get slave, they didn't get put on onto the agenda to do the presentation. Well, it's, it's your call. Okay. The chairman was under the impression you would be doing it. This yeah, week. I just, I was afraid of having them wait that long for the whole uh, board meeting to get to new business. And so, you know, they wanted to be there to answer the questions, but. So. We'll do it however you want to do it. Okay. So if you want, don't want to do it that way, just let, call him tomorrow and let him know however you, you know, it's, it's your, Areas. I mean, but they're doing it just for the benefit of the board. So whatever the board feel like they 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 right. need from the mental health board. Was it? So they just want to before they're gonna publicize the total amounts for everybody that got money. Right. And they just thought it'd be fair that the board gets the list and the amounts first before it get, it goes public. I got you. Okay. Well. Um, the way it was described to me is that you were going to share. Yeah, I was going to share the list, but. Uh, I won't be 
very detailed in answering every question and they want to be there to answer every question. So, so yeah, <laughs> however you want to handle this, okay. it's up to you. Just I, I ask them to stay for the whole meeting. Okay. We can do it. No, we can move it to the front. Yeah, yeah. we could make an agenda change and move okay. Tim's item up so that we don't have to go. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, just um, give Shirley a call because that's just what they, you know, that was okay. the first I heard about it today. One know. of the things I requested of that committee is when they make their decisions before they, they release it to the public and they come before us and release it to us first. Right. Yeah, good. well, it's already been released to the public. And that was well, just the, that one, not all of them. Huh? Not just all that, yeah, not all of them, just right. that one. And then that's the, the one thing that I, I always feel everything gets released to the newspaper and we read it, and that's how we find out. Or else it gets on those uh, yeah. Yeah. TVs, two, three. Yeah, yeah. All three of them were on the rear wheel going. Yeah. But I, I truly, and anything, it's not just that. It's a lot of things that get released to the newspaper before we hear it or see it, and we should have that knowledge. Okay, um, Mr. Groves. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one more thing. Um, I'm trying to set up a uh, neighborhood meeting to address uh, crime and what we are doing as a county and other municipalities. So I'm working with myself, Mr. Salgado, and Mr. McCarthy, and hopefully Mr. Faulkman to actually have a neighborhood meeting in District 2 to combine those four districts that touch each other, uh, coordinate everything for public speakers about what we're doing to address crime, what we're working on, what are our challenges, what are some of the neighborhoods, you know, hearing so we can get out there and just to throw it out there, but if you have a district next to a district and you guys want to get four of you together, I'd be more than happy to coordinate the public speakers to come out and actually address the public and the neighborhoods. So I think it's vital. It's the number one thing that I'm hearing about. What are we doing about crime? What are we doing about the shooting? So if you, and it's totally up to you guys if you want to do that, but I'd be more than willing to get the speakers, whoever I can, to come there and answer questions and give a presentation. I just had a neighborhood meeting. Was, yeah, uh, that was. Uh, was uh, her, <laughs> you know when you get a hold of get a hold of Karen, get a hold of Karen. She can, yeah, Tim and I are going to be attending one on the 28th of this yeah. month at Station One, doing the same thing with, with the aldermen and the county board members and the city and whoever else is going to be there. And then it's the neighborhood group, too. Mm -hmm. We're doing that, I believe, on the 28th. That uh, was uh, organized by what's the name of the organization? Westgate Coalition. Yeah. Westgate. yeah. So that'd, just, be a good, that'd be a good one. Yeah, and I would encourage uh, your districts that surround that to invite them in there also. You know, if we can do it in four meetings and get all 20 districts dialed in in about a month or so, what it'd be a good they, message to send out to the folks that we do care that we are doing something. Okay. Just all right. Well, that's, that'd probably be good to mention too in the board meeting when yeah. that one's there. Thank you. Um, okay, then um, <clears throat> we have uh, appointments, uh, the new Milford Fire Protection District. Um, <coughs> oh, Rob Sickler, that's a reappointment. The Cherry Valley Fire Protection District, there's three, uh, William Beaver, Rebecca June. I can't read that. Hi. Sorry. I'm thinking for Carl Erickson. Um, Board of Health, uh, Gabrielle Torina. This is um, the Board of Health is one I've been, I guess, focused on. And I, I did speak with Ms. Torina today. I think she'll be a very active board member. So I'll be voting for her. She was, you know, right away said she's gonna make sure she's in attendance for all the meetings. And she'd already been reading the minutes of past meetings. So she seems like she'll be very engaged. And, you know, on the Board of Health, one of the things I'd like to see us do, I, I, I don't know if any of you got it, but, you know, through COVID, you get calls and complaining about what the health department does. It's not really our thing. I think that the phone numbers and contact information for all this board should be on our website so we can just tell constituents to call and say, 
you have to call the members of the board of health yeah. um, so that they have a avenue to get to you know the decision makers of the health department. Oh, Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Chairman. I support the nomination for the Milford Fire. Thank you. Um, the last nomination is uh, Greg Tilly to the uh, uh, Zoning Board of Appeals. And uh, Jim Webster, I think, already spoke in favor of him at the last meeting. He was with our zoning department for a long time. Mm -hmm. Right, he says not only that, he was even on our, on our board. And but, the son was on the zoning uh, board of appeals. Yeah, well. he's been around for a while. So he's very qualified. Um, is there any other comments or questions about any of the, the appointments? I, I have. Go um, ahead, Ms. Red. I guess I need to back up. I thought I heard you mention something about a meeting at District 1 on the 28th. Yes. OK. If I remember correctly, I did not see the health department in attendance for that meeting. And I think they should be there. Oh, Can I some believe Thompson Kelly called them to even have a um, the bus out there to do injections if anyone wants one. Okay, I think they need to be what? inside answer questions as well. Yeah. I'll ask Dr. Martell. I'll be talking to her tomorrow night. Okay. To see if, if she'll uh, to talk or just not. I don't know what Aunt House and Kelly set it up for. Okay. Thank you. You too. Okay. Um, any other uh, new business anyone wants to discuss? Uh, Mr. Girl, I got one thing. I think Chairman was, you know, trying to set up kind of a, you know, I spoke about it last time, setting up kind of a directory of services that we can mail out to our residents that can show them and exactly where they go for mental health, you know, all the way down the line, non-emergency numbers, uh, zoning, you know, just a directory of services so people can have that. They're all the men who it is who their community officer is. If we could set up something like that or even get it on the website. Well, I don't think people are receiving them because the questions that I get are, it seems like it's always the same kind of questions. Like, who, who do I, I got a tree down, who do I call? Or, who, you know, what's my fence so that? And that brings me into another thing is we can have all this on a mobile app. We can have a mobile app for our uh, elected officials so I can see all the uh, committees, the agendas, everything on my mobile app. Um, I can zoning, I can do, type in fence, everything related to a fence and the county will pop up through zoning, um, RV on asphalt, RV on tape. You know, I can search that. And our residents can also use that mobile app to get into the county and see, you know, if they want to know the minutes, who's my board member, where are the um, neighborhood meetings at? Uh, what what time do they meet? Who runs those? You know, it'd just be nice if we had that information out there. I know we're talking about redoing our website. Um, so it's just something, you know, I think we need to have a conversation either with IT, administration, on exactly what we're going to spend our money on the website. It's just going to be a fancy homepage, or are we actually going to have things that can work for us? Is the maps that'd be another great thing on the mobile app is I can look up my district map, I can look up my congressional map, alderman map, things like that. So I know just, the folks in IT love it when we give them more projects. And this could be something like no opinion on that. <laughs> you know, if we're gonna hire someone to do a website, they can also do a mobile version uh, very easily. So well, um, there's conversations going on. Um, to hire a public information officer mm -hmm. to deal with our messaging, which we do very little of now. Yeah, we and, do. And very I think good. that um, as that comes forward, that would be a good thing to bring in as far as the job duties of that office, because mm -hmm. um, that seems to me to be in line with what you would expect. That yeah, I would think so. And you know, if we're not conveying our message and what we're doing to address certain things with certain times, like COVID would have been a great thing. We could have had that messaging out there. 
uh, you know, the health department, they can chime in and also use that messaging service too. So just something to think about. I just, I think there's a lot of information out there and people don't know where to go. If I, my son who's 13 has a mental health crisis, <laughs> who do I call? Where do I go? Who will see him? Who won't? I don't have insurance. Now I can't go anywhere or is there someplace I can go without insurance so I can take it? So if I had that directory, mental health, youth, Hey, numbers right there. There's four services I can call. I think it's a great idea, and I think it's worthy of us, you know, advancing it forward. So I'd stay on it. Okay. And like I said, as this position gets, you know, defined and filled, you know, that would probably be the person to coordinate that, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Okay. I Thank might you. be wrong, but the, whoever is downstairs on the desk as you walk in the front door, do they not have a directory? Uh, just about everything, or don't you know either? They do have access to uh, numbers, information. They are an information desk. Uh, so that, that's already been started, and all we need to do is add to it. And I believe so. Uh, I, I think that's what you would have to do. I don't know if any of you know that desk downstairs. Have you ever, have you ever talked to the people? There's a special number for that desk, so you even as uh, a county board member, if you call that number and say, geez, I, I need to get a hold of the highway department or I need to get a hold of Rockford Township, who do I call? And the gentleman down there or the woman down there will give you that information. We've had that information system for a, quite a few years, have we not? That is true. Uh, I believe uh, Lori Gumow uh, oversees <laughs> that, that area. Then that's something we need to talk to her about expanding that. It was an work and advertising that 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 we do have that service. Yeah, actually, to answer your thing is uh, some of the help that they've had down there because it was limited on how much help that they were able to find. Some of them are actually also volunteers uh, that were there, but they can only be there for three or four hours tops, and then they're gone. So, so we'll just turn that into an app. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I'm on the Window of Times website right now, and, and many of the things that you spoke of, you can find with Google. But it is difficult. It is very difficult. I mean, I'll, I'm, I know because I know sometimes when people will call me and say, oh, I'll Google it. In a couple, two or three minutes or five, yeah, you can find it, but it's a multiple clicks and getting in deep and trying and there and all that instead of being very, very friendly. And I had to look up some ordinance things, and it's, it's it takes a bit. Right. It does. It'd be great if I just had a mobile app I can type in whatever. And it'd and be easier for us because they're still on the call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even if they uh, and well, I, I don't have a smartphone. I think uh, a lot of people just get a call. It's usually when you get a phone call from the constituents when you get across in their manner in their manner. Then I got to tell them. I don't know either. Let me call you back because I have to go and do the same research that you just got frustrated doing. So, well, Not we'll definitely easy. keep that on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, okay, is there anything further for this evening? Okay, can I have a motion to adjourn? I motion. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those no. All right. Good night, everybody. <laughs> 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 <laughs>